what open objectivism is about, is that we think for ourselves. And that means we don't always agree, even on very serious matters. We disagree with each other about important philosophical issues with real ramifications for how we live. And we have serious, mutually respectful conversations about our disagreements. I think we've seen that on display, even in the talks that were part of this symposium. And I think we will see it uh, even more in this afternoon's panel. Let me introduce our speakers. Uh, next to me is my colleague, Will Thomas, uh, director of programs at the Atlas Society, teaches objectivism, spoke on objectivist ethics for parents and children. Next to him, Donnie U. Shortridge, uh, Montessori teacher and educator. Uh, and Roslyn Ross, a uh, former executive man uh, with a radical theory about applying objectivism uh, to the relationship uh, between parent and child as a relationship between two autonomous individuals seeking their own self interest. Uh, I am going to ask at least some of the first questions. I'm going to try to get the panelists talking to one another, uh, not just back and forth with me. And I'm also going to go to the mic over there uh, for questions. That is, I'm going to invite you to go to the mic, and I will uh, turn to you ask questions. Uh, Open-ended questions are best. Please try to make them more or less in the form of a question, although I think in a panel session like this, adding your voice a bit more uh, I think we're going to try to keep um, And I would also suggest that it would be best if questions could be such uh, that they could be addressed to more than one panelist uh, in order to uh, get out the diversity of opinion uh, that we have represented here today. Um, so the first question that I want to raise uh, is really a question for Donnie, but it's a question asking her to respond to something that Rosalind says. So I'm going to start by asking Rosalind to repeat herself on something. Rosalind, could you give, again, your definition of intrinsic motivation? say that it depends on the age of the child. Uh, I don't know that they, at under three or four, have a sense of purpose yet. I think it develops. I think as will develops and reason emerges, that that definition holds. But I would say on a continuum, yes, I don't have a problem with that definition. Well, I was going to Less than I would be very curious to know, um, so when I look at an infant and I see him uh, focus his eyes on something that he wants to see, he's making a conscious choice to focus or not focus. When he reaches his arm out for the first time, he's making a conscious choice to focus his muscles. And so I don't understand this idea that uh, that he doesn't have volition, is that what you just said? Yes. Yes, so infants infants more. don't make conscious choices. Um, I guess that depends on how you define consciousness, because I would define conscious choice as focusing my brain. And um, an infant focuses his brain all the time, the way I see it. Well, it's not that their brain is abused, but what they're doing is they're taking in impressions from the world in a sensory way, and it's going into the deep memory called the Mimi. And that is not part of the conscious brain. That's the short-term brain, the conscious brain. But right now, 
the child's information that's coming in is going into the deep memory, the subconscious brain. So it's not really a choice at this point, in my, in my view. Oh, okay. So you're basing it on, will he do it automatically or make a choice? Well, I guess you can, right. I would want to hear your definition of choice. There's no volition at this point in the child's world under this age because they're, 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 so, they're, sen they're sensory motor children who are responding to the stimulus of the environment. They're developing their ability to do that, but they don't have it yet as an infant. It's not that they can't respond to you. I'm not saying they don't respond to you, but they don't make volitional choices until they acquire some reason. And it's an emerging capability. I have a little anecdote. <laughs> when my oldest son was born, and I don't intend my children to be convincing data. I don't, I just, this is an anecdote. And a totalizing claim is made, I guess, in any example that is counter to it serves. Now, when my son was born, he lacked, my oldest son, uh, he lacked a strong sucking reflex. And so, I, you know, he just wouldn't take milk. And he developed a um, uh, really good problem, essentially, um, he was, was going to be a fatal situation if he didn't get nutrition eventually. And it was a really scary uh, period, and eventually we were able to get it sufficiently lactated, and his reflexes built up better. But it was, it was scary. Um, the point was, uh, this seemed to me pretty obviously just a case of a set of one of the few instincts that humans have, full functional instincts, and the sucking instinct is one of these, just not operating very strongly. In it. And it threatened his whole his life, and without medical intervention, he would have died. So the point is, it wasn't like he didn't feel like eating, and it wasn't like uh, I don't think it's a reasonable interpretation of what happened, that he just didn't feel like eating and then later decided to. Instead, he didn't feel like eating, and by not feeling like eating, he uh, became weaker and weaker, and he almost died, and then with some medical therapy, we were able to get his energy levels back up, and eventually the sucking reflex and response to help. Interpreting it as an act of choice on his part, and I'm not. I don't think he made any choice there. I don't there. understand how I'm calling everything an act of choice. Okay, I'm sorry. Maybe I misunderstood what you were doing. So, if you, so you guys are on the, the um, on the uh, what I'm. I yeah, I'm not arguing <coughs> that children are or are not one thing or another. Um, you can argue that children are just like rodents and they're all reflexive and they're all no choice. That doesn't therefore mean that controlling behaviorist tactics are the way to that's I have not entered a defense yet of controlling behaviors, tactics, in any form. So, I, I would put the person in my mouth. If you want to ask me about my views, you're welcome. Uh, well, let me actually ask this. Robin, do you think, uh, with your uh, description of the scenario of uh, rescue, mm -hmm. that the child necessarily is making a choice um, in the sense of an uh, exercise in position. And if not, how does that relate to his development of volition? Well, um, um, I would say that if, so I would call it a choice, and if it's not 
a choice the way an adult makes a choice, then it's a free choice or a, or a less different brain area choice, a um, less permanent choice. Um, but yeah, I see babies make choices all day, every day. This way or that way. And, but when it comes to, you know, you can't make a choice that you don't have. So if I want to suck, but I don't have the ability to suck, it, you're not, you don't have a choice to make there. So That, that is also true. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Maybe you can't Apparently, choose to walk. Not, not choose to walk. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's not the choice. Okay. Yeah. Um, what okay, <laughs> We'd like to move, uh, and by the way, at this point, if people have questions they want to start out with, please do come to the microphone. Uh, you can know, share this task of asking questions, sir. Yeah, uh, I, well, I'd love to. I, please, when you come to the microphone, begin by stating your name. Oh, uh, my name's Randy, uh, Randy Bullrat. I'd love to hear a little more elaboration from Please uh, direct your questions, your question to somebody or somebody's. Okay, yeah. I heard Alex say that you prefer more uh, broader questions to different panels. So I'd love to hear a little bit more elaboration from all of you on your theories of uh, how, you, how you would apply objectivism to parenting, maybe your specialty, uh, just so we can get a better idea of uh, moving forward. Well, um, and let me ask that Will start uh, in response to that, because Will sort of said you might get to that now. Right, sure. Um, you know, I'll just say about um, uh, theories of parenting, this is something I've done as a self-consciously objectivist father. It's not something that I've done in a scholarly way. And um, I don't think, in, except in broad strokes, that parenting, in my social ethics project, I don't think I've done much beyond these broad strokes. You, know, you want your child to flourish. But in any case, so what I'm saying is more or less, you know, it's thought is thoughtful, but it's just based on that. Um, so I think that um, obviously, because what we're seeking in our, what I think one's seeking in a relationship with a child, in, with one's child, is to develop a, a relationship based on mutual appreciation that over time and through a set of shared experiences, um, and of course mutual respect, will develop into uh, a genuine, lasting, lifelong, and loving relationship. I mean, that's basically the reason we have kids, as far as I can tell. So that's what it's all about. Now, that said, um, children have peculiar mental characteristics. They're not adults, and you can't treat them like adults. So you have to treat them like children. And among their deficits are weakness of will, or deficits is not quite right. Children are excellent at a bunch of things. Children have amazing abilities to learn things. They have a plasticity of the mind and the subconscious that adults don't have. Uh, children up to, I don't know, the age of five or so, can learn any language with you know, total phonemic fluency. And the most well-meaning adults who are focus their whole minds on learning a language that uses phonemes that they can't pronounce, will they, they'll never master that language. Never. They'll truly master it. Never have. I mean, I've never known anyone who could do that. As far as I know, data, that's extremely rare. That's an example. Children are excellent. And that's just one very concrete example. They're excellent at all sorts of things. But they're not good at certain things that adults do better. And one of those things is, um, the extent of self-control they have, the degree to which they can exert their will to control themselves is important. And they're not good at thinking long-term. They're just not, not good at um, recognizing those things over the long term. So one of your roles as a parent is to try and provide some moral instruction and advice and counsel uh, and indeed even incentives and responses to help your child uh, overcome some of those deficits or not suffer problems from some of those deficits. Now, 
in that context, though, I think it's very important to um, let your children uh, do as much as they can and keep them in an environment where they're authentically engaged with their values and where their choices can be. And as their faculties develop, their uh, conceptual ability develops, their will develops, their self-consciousness of themselves develops, their awareness of other people as possessing minds, spirits, and feelings, which also develops over time, uh, develops, then you can have more and more of a completely open-ended relationship where um, basically the arrangements in the house are uh, arrangements based on understanding of where the children are in their development and what we're all looking for in this relationship and what we need to do over the next several years to make everyone happy. You know, that's and get the things done that have to get done. You know, right? So that's about it. I guess a couple, sorry, this is my whole theory of parenting. I wasn't, <laughs> you can talk, but you know, I've got a lot to say about it. So I, a couple high points for me as an objectivist parent. So things that mattered to me a lot were um, not being deontological. And so to that extent, um, and this could be a, a, an interesting conversation from something you said, Donahue. Um, I didn't believe in having household chores as such. So for my, for my children, one aspect of not being de deontological was that their allowance was connected to the basic household chores they do. And so that the, con the idea was that the conversation about doing those chores would never be you have to take out the garbage, but then it's time to take out the garbage. Do you want me to take out the garbage and you don't get your allowance? Or do you want to take out the garbage? And uh, that's been, that was the idea. Now, I have to say that a lot of those conversations in tone sound, you know, in our household, a lot of the conversations about the garbage have sounded deontological. <laughs> I was gonna say, how's that working, Bill? Well, in a sense, it's been, it's been awesome. My kids never beg me for money. Have, you know, well, the son who did learn to stop <laughs> when I didn't give it to him. They never beg me for money. They become savers and responsible about that. They, there's not a, again, there's no big fight about these chores. Uh, and if they just said we don't want to do them anymore, they're welcome to. They, so that's. That's how that in the concrete. But another thing was, I was big on not, not ever saying you must share. I was very big on saying you try to trade. <laughs> so you know, try, that was that was the thing. You know, that was another thing that just bugged me. I didn't like the sharing. And I don't know. That's those are just a few anecdotes, the kind of things that I uh, thought about. Oh, another thing, total factual response to the children at all times. One of the things that Rawson emphasized was speaking to the children in adult language from the word go. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, because, you know, they're, they're people. So, uh, that, that uh, so, but complete uh, factual relation, uh, act, response to them and a willingness to answer any question they have. A lot of parents complain about their children saying, why, 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 why? But in our household, if a child said, like, why is the sky blue? Well, we'd say, well, it's because of the refraction of the light in the sky. And then why is the light whatever? You know, to say, well, this and then Either they're interested and they'll keep talking about it, you know, and you have a conversation, or they're not, and they won't. But then you don't get why, 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 why. You have interesting conversations, or you don't. So those were some highlights. Thanks for your question. I think we should continue, with, not that we don't answer these questions now, but later when we can all sit around with a glass of beer and really get into allowance or not allowance, um, why children ask why, at what age, and all of that. Um, I guess to speak to your question, I would say that objectivism and parenting coincide because we have this privilege as a parent to model for the children what it is to be fully human in a way that imprints them deeply in a way that no other relationship will have or ideally will have as a profound influence. And so I think that it's a privilege and a responsibility to be a parent as an objectivist. And all the things that Will and Rosen said are, you know, are part of it as well. But I guess if you're asking, does it is it consistent? 
with each with each other? I would say definitely yes, because in in objectivism and in parenting, you're looking to optimize the ideal of the human, which is self is is efficacious, competent, compassionate adulthood, and you get to have the privilege of guiding your child to that through to maturity. Um, so, I am the controversial speaker, as you may have uh, acquired or <laughs> figured out. Um, I have read a lot about children. Uh, Goodreads.com keeps track of what I read, and I've had around 700 books on the subject now. So, I am uh, the, I'm not uh, William Thomas, though he is, he's an expert on objectivism in a way that I am not. Um, I have, I worked with, uh, I worked with behavior modification for 10 years, uh, making children do all of these things that would make them the, uh, the perfect human being or the vision that their parents have for them. And I learned that um, making children be what you think would be awesome or what you think would make them so happy doesn't work. Um, I learned that children have to establish and pursue their own goals because so um, for I can, you know most of you were not at my talk. Um, one of the things I was hired to do was make an obese teenager, a girl, uh, thin because her parents thought she would be so much happier if she were just thin. And um, so I developed a program. I motivated her. I coerced her. I did everything that, and and I was always an objectivist about it. Like I was always straight up. I was always, um, this is our goal. You want it too, don't you? You see why it's a good goal, don't you? Uh, let's plan this together, how we're going to make you achieve this goal that your parents and I have pushed on you. Um, and I, I was always honest with them. Um, and it was a huge moment for me when she finally hit her goal weight. She looked amazing and she just couldn't give she couldn't, she did not care. This was not her goal. She, she actually wanted to be a cook and totally envisioned herself as an obese cook. Like, what's wrong with being obese if you're a cook? Isn't that cute? Um, so, the, 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 the thing that makes me controversial here is that when I read about, I wanted to study objectivist parenting. I wanted to read about parenting from an objectivist perspective because I wanted to be a mom and I was working with children because I wanted to be the best objectivist mom ever. And um, finding information about objectivist parenting was really kind of a nightmare. There wasn't much of it. And when I eventually started have, realizing, learning, and getting to the point in my intellectual development um, that I got to, I noticed this, what I saw as this contradiction. Objectivists say, we, um, we are all individuals and we believe in mutual respect and freedom, um, but not when it comes to kids. When it comes to kids, they're just these irrational, silly creatures and we got to make them do what we know is best for them. And uh, we will be as respectful as we, we can, just, you know, and then we'll make them do what we think is best for them. Um, so we have the same goal um, uh, up here. Um, we all want to have good relationships with our children. We all want to have respectful, mutually respectful relationships with our children. Um, I just think it is uh, very contradictory for objectivists to approach parenting with, uh, with coercion, of course, and I don't think it works. The way we want it to, to be clear. <laughs> Hi, my name's Kai. Um, so I have a couple questions, but my first um, would be directed at Roslyn. Um, so earlier I saw Donahue speak, and she talked about before the age of six that rules um, and order is something that is uh, should be reinforced and very present um, in a child's development because um, I'm not sure, Donahue, you can probably say it better than I can. And, um, so I just wanted Roslyn to respond to it. Because I know that Rosalind probably has a different take on rules and um, order and how that should be integrated in the child's life. Well, let me let me read the first. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Say, let me clarify what order is and what I was referring to. And order is is about ordering of the mind, ordering of that we have, we are born with a mathematical mind that seeks order in the universe. 
universe and seeks to, to figure out what all of the everything is. And so for young children, they need external order offered to them. So things like routines and everything in the same place at the same time and we treat them the same way. Ross had talked earlier about if you uh, say the same things to your children every time that you uh, change a diaper, they do then start to respond because it's orderly and they've heard it. So that's what I mean by order, is, is creating a system where they're a system, but a, an environment where they can make sense of the world, that it's rational and knowable and safe. So that's what I mean by order. Well, I like that. The world makes sense. Uh, I like the world making sense, however, uh, I'll tell you that I think we actually don't agree because I've read a lot of books by Marie Montessori and this is one of the ways I disagree with her. Um, she believes that children have a sensitive period that they, she does talk a lot about order, and um, I think she never saw a kid that I had raised until he was three. I don't think it's inherent in their temperament that they need this you have to have an org you have to be consistent with your kids is one of uh, what I find one of the greatest um, horrible uh, parenting memes that we have out there. Um, I try to be authentic with my son. I try not to be consistent in the name of consistency. And um, so that's Montessori and I disagree a little bit on that. And then I, you know, she writes a lot about three year olds and she writes a lot about <laughs> Um, infants, and um, I think she was an expert in three to six year olds. But she was an expert in the three to six year olds that she was given. It's hard to study. Um, I, I find that with studies on children is that I'm very frustrated when I read them because I'm like, I didn't get to raise that kid, so of course you're going to conclude all these things about what standard American children are like. Um, Actually, before, before we go back to your time, uh, Donna, you were going to do one Can I offer just a little comment about something that's been puzzling me, uh, Rosalind? And I, I, I also like some questions at some point if anyone's interested about what ethical advice we should give to children for them to use in their own lives. What would be good principles for children? Another way to put it would be what would be good principles for children to know, however they came to know them. Uh, but um, one of the things that I found puzzling. Uh, Rosalind, in listening to your descriptions of your raising your child, is that um, myself, I have two children, and they're temperamentally rather different. And if, if everything that you say about your child could have been said about my oldest child, it is coercive. Why? He was a rule follower and a nice kid, you know, and always just divined what people expected of him. And went his own way, but just wasn't the kind of person who caused trouble with others. He's a high achieving student, uh, very self motivated. You know, he's, he's got a lot of uh, things uh, going for him. He's a great kid. Um, I wish he could have come. I actually just read out the show this year. I wish he could have come, but he's taking exams right now. That's cool. So. But my younger son is more um, has kind of defensive temperament is more combative, etc. And so with no, at least probably not with any real change in the method that we used to raise him, the actual way we interacted over a bunch of issues was different. Um, so that's just, um, it would be, I guess I'd ask you, you're, you said you're frustrated about studies uh, that you read. Do you know of any um, broad studies of child rearing using a philosophy like the one you're advocating? Okay. I, I, I'm raising my child and equals one. <laughs> Hi, my name is Ailey. Um, one thing that I, well, I'm not a parent, but one thing I've always heard about parents, noticed about my own parents, and it's usually a big compliment for parents, is that they're selfless and they make so many sacrifices for their children. Um, you know, they give up going on vacation to send them to a good school or they, you know, other things like that. They, give up their time to drive them to Saunders instead of doing whatever they want. Um, so whenever reading Ayn Rand, obviously, in her philosophy, she talks about being selfish um, and reject self-sacrifice. So 
So I've always wondered how you could reconcile those two ideas, um, if you can, and how you all do that. Um, own your choices and don't do things you don't want to do. I mean, that, that's a wrong way of saying it. As a parent, I think you're definitely giving up some things you had as an adult, and you're paying money you weren't otherwise paying, and you're doing it to invest in a relationship with a person. That's really what you're doing. Um, and, uh, and of course, to invest in that, you got to invest in that person. So that's what you're doing. Um, now, one example where this comes up for me, at least I'm puzzled about, is I drive my younger son to school in the morning. He rides back on the bus. And the reason is, is that the bus comes too early. It comes early enough for kids to have breakfast at school. And he, why would he have breakfast at school? It's ridiculous. And I, I think, you know, I care about him. So my wife has said sometimes to me, I, you know, why do you drive him? He could, you know, you're, you're wasting 20 minutes of your day. And uh, my reaction is just, I value him. You know, I value his 20 minutes. And it's not bad. I'm not doing much at that time in the morning. So am I a self-sacrificing parent? Or am I someone who cares about his son and thinks his son's 20 minutes in the morning is worth doing something about? Now, I'm not picking him up in the afternoon. He can take the bus, but the bus is not going to delay him. I would, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I would say, I actually addressed that exact question in, in my talk. I, I'm tempted to quote myself right now, but I think the uh, I think the answer to your question is that parents spend an awful lot of time trying to figure out how to make their kids be the person they want them to be, rather than focusing on themselves and making themselves the hero they want to see in their children. To summarize, um, I, I quote: um, "My parents worked so hard for my future hypothetical happiness when all I wanted, what I desperately needed, was to see theirs." I think you raised a really good question, and I'm excited that you and other young people are asking that question, because when it comes time to be a parent, you have to make that choice. And the choice is a hierarchy of values, and you subordinate one for another. And it takes skill, and it takes knowledge, as it would for any decision you go into making. What is, what are the pros, what are the cons, what is at stake here? What is it that is my goal for doing it, for making this choice, like you would with any choice? And at, with any choice you make, there's the for, foregone choice that you don't make. And it's about say, okay, yes, as Will was saying earlier, yes, I don't get to go to Tahiti on my own with my wife. I have to stay home because my child has, um, you know, a camp or something. And so, you make those conscious choices, and if it's a conscious choice that you're making, you make it willingly and you say, I accept the lost opportunity. I accept that there's things that I won't be doing because I see that what I will be doing is of higher value to me. You said you would like to hear some questions about the ethics that a child should apply. So let me ask you this, and ask uh, really particularly by you and not this. Suppose that a child observes that by far the uh, overwhelmingly significant outcomes of his actions are those that are chosen by his parents. That is, Rewards, punishments, that sort of thing. Uh, would a rational child then decide to pursue a principle of manipulation and of trying to please his parents or to something else? And if so, could you repeat the question? Suppose that a child grows up. Okay, how old is the child? Uh, Suppose take you know, you know frankly take any age you okay. please. Okay. Or better yet, answer for a range of ages. Okay. And what's the question? 
Suppose that the child observed that his parents control the outcomes of his actions to a very great extent. He tries to do something, and much, and much more than the natural outcome of his actions, what he experiences is a reward or a punishment, praise or blame, and so forth, expansion of his range of options or contraction thereof by his parents' decision. Should he then focus in choosing his actions on his parents' judgment or on the facts he was going to try to influence the Well, I think that's an emerging capability. I think that as a young child, you don't have the, the range of knowledge or the experience to make those choices on your own. But as will develops, as consciousness develops, as your efficacy in the world yourself develops, you get to make your own choices. And part of the job of the child moving into that third plane is to propel yourself out of childhood and you make those choices yourself. And as anybody who's got it and who's been an adult of a 13 year old will tell you that they will tell you everything that's wrong with you. And so they will butt up against you and that's their job to do that. So they are starting to make adult type choices for themselves as they become efficacious in that area, and that's great. Uh, I, do I don't know. think you're responding to my question. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Would you repeat it then? The question is, suppose that you observe that your parents are doing a lot of rewarding and punishing, uh -huh. so that you have a uh, better ability to achieve a result if you were to manipulate your parents if you were to try to achieve that result correctly. Okay, give me an example. What, what, what scenario? Give me a scenario. Like, what is it that um, the parent is doing? Are they saying, if you practice the piano, you get stickers? I mean, what, what are you, what? Um, suppose that the parent is saying, um, you know, suppose that when it comes to getting, the only way the child has to get is to persuade the parent to buy them. Okay. Uh, and the parent tends to buy him things when he does what the parent wants. Okay. Uh, or when he pleads, or when he invokes some need. Uh, and not otherwise. Uh, should he try to uh, focus on pleasing his parents rather than on other ways? Well, as I all. I'll go back to my first answer, which is at some age levels, children don't know that there's an alternative. If all of they've been raised with, if they're seven, eight, nine years old, and all that they've been raised with is rewards and punishments, it takes them a while to figure out, oh, there's another way to do this. And so they do have to break away from their parents, and the way they do that is they go out in the culture more and they see different choices of ways to respond. But once that they see there's another choice, absolutely. Yeah, rewards and punishments are not internally motivated. So yeah, is that? I don't know if I'm doing. It. I'm answering. Okay. Your question. Go ahead, Bill. At the beginning, you were, but then you turned back to saying okay. what parents should do. What What she said. I, you're You're painting. So yes, if you're painting a picture of a family where um, the child is practicing the piano because the parents said you're damn well going to learn an instrument, and we want you to learn piano. And you're going to do piano, or else uh, we're going to cut off all of your allowance and uh, not give you any dessert for you know ten months. That kind of thing. Um, right. That sucks. I mean, that's bad. You know, that's not a good relationship, and that's not the that's not the way to to have a good relationship with your child. So that's that's not it. But you're saying you know, you want to question that how the child should respond. Child in that circumstance. Uh, what should the child do? Well, your your premise that the child has realized all these things. So the things that Donahue said about how the child could possibly come to realize that is relevant. And then if the child realizes that there are arbitrary rules being imposed on the child solely to, without consideration for the child's own well-being, then it's ethically this is important. It's one of the one of the things that I wanted to emphasize in my talk is that one of the most important issues for children is that because they are born into a dependent situation, 
and they're, and they're in a situation to be educated as well, there's a very important journey that they go through where they come to uh, where the, the principle of independence, and particularly mental independence, um, is something that they need to develop and learn to apply. And the moment that they can learn that just because other people are authorities or their parents or whatever doesn't make what they say true, it makes them able to figure out to keep a critical attention to what authorities say to them. That's a very important moral achievement and crucial in anyone's development and very important because if you're in a, situ in a situation like you described, it's one of the necessary steps you'll have to achieve in order to begin to orient your life towards better value. We had an audience question. Hi, I'm Carmen. This is a question for everyone. How much freedom should children be allowed to have, to have or until what's the limit of of their freedom? Start with what? Um, I think uh, generally the goal is to, um, as much as you can, uh, have the children not be conscious of their being rules of any sort. The, the, where, whereas it is necessary to worry sometimes if the children would do something that was uh, dangerous or, or harmful or very bad in some other way. And that does happen sometimes. Uh, generally, you just don't want that to be an issue. And so um, you try hard not to have there be uh, binding rules as such in the, in the relationship, but when there are things that you think would be good habits for your children to have or practices, you can, for instance, when they're very young, manipulate their environment. I thought it would be nice for my children to be uh, bilingual, so I manipulated the environment, so they were brought up bilingual. And then when we sent them home to school, the school we sent them to was bilingual. So, there. I mean, and, they, they, were, they were participatory in all these decisions insofar as they were participatory, but it was also just part of their life, right? And then now that they're older, they're in a position where they could just say, bag it. And to various degrees, they, they don't just say, bag it. To various degrees, they own it or don't. But it, they, that's, they are at an age where now they could just say, bag it, and they don't. So for that issue. But there's lots of things like that. I mean, in other words, I was worried about children uh, watching too much TV when they're young. So we just never played the TV when they were around, and we never talked about it as something like that. And when we got the videos, we got the videos that we thought were educational and interesting and would stimulate the right things. And so as far as they knew, all their childhood, those were videos. And they liked them, you know, when they were little kids. And then when they got older, they learned about other things. We never said, you can't watch that cartoon, or you can't do this other thing, and it's all, that's all good. Not that issue. Did they even come home from school and say, the other kids do this, this is how it did them? Why can't we? I had a good friend whose uh, mother had not played much television for him, so um, she had a great answer. And he'd come home and said, the other kids watch The Lone Ranger on TV. She said, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> in, our case, in our case, we didn't do that kind of manipulation. It was more like, there was a time, actually TV wasn't really the, much of an issue, but there was a time when a kid came home and said, oh, the other kids watch a lot of TV, and we're like, well, okay, but we don't like to. You know, that's, and then it just didn't come back up. Computers and computer games, a different issue. That's the crack cocaine. <laughs> I would say that to answer your question that your goal always is to allow your child as much freedom as they can quote unquote handle and that's you know, an objective or a subjective decision but what I like to suggest is that you provide an environment within which they have the maximum amount of freedom 
so that you're not always having to come over and say, no, you can't do that, or you can't do that. So you put them in an environment that's appropriate for where they are developmentally, and then within that environment, you let them be as free as possible. So again, so you're not being punitive with them. But then you expand their world as they're able to handle more. So for example, uh, we talked earlier today about you know, in the second plane of development, you want to be sure your child has a bicycle or some kind of vehicle where they can get themselves beyond where you can see them at the house. But you don't just give them the bicycle and say, go. You start when they're two or one and you, and you are taking the buggy rides or the walks with your child in where they're going to eventually go. So it's a place and a, a situation they become familiar with. And you model for them how we look both ways to cross the street and how we watch out for the big bad dog or the whatever in the neighborhood. So that by the time that you set them free, they have competencies and capabilities to handle themselves like that. So I'll give one more example. Um, there was uh, when my daughter turned 13, we decided we were going to teach her how to take the city bus and scared out of my husband and me, but we were determined she was going to learn how to do it. So we spent I spent that entire summer with her practicing taking the bus. And by the time the summer was almost over, I said, all right, you, you leave now. Where are we going? And how much do we pay? Where's the money and the bus gas and all that? And once I was confident she knew how to do it, I let her go. But you don't just throw them in the deep end, if you will, and expect them to figure it out because they need guidance. So you give them as the answer you give them as I think you give them as much freedom as they can handle. Um, I have two answers. Uh, first one is or the way I talk about it is uh, from a point of view of relationships. So, how much freedom do you give your husband? Um, you're not giving him freedom. Now your husband won't necessarily feel that he has the freedom to go have sex with other women. But that's not because he doesn't actually have the freedom to do that. He, he does have the freedom to do that. But he would never do that because it would hurt you. So the way I think about that question, um, how much freedom do I give my child, it really I'm not, first of all, I don't see myself as giving it to him. Um, I, I see us in a relationship and our boundaries are always, um, sometimes he touches on my boundaries and sometimes I touch on his and it's a negotiation the way any relationship is. Um, and then to answer your question in a different way, there's a great uh, quote, a child will not attempt to make a choice he does not believe he is capable of making. I don't think that we have to design our child's world nearly as much as we think we do. Um, children expand their own world. They, we don't open the gates. They <coughs> open the gates. They um, design their lives. Um, so how much, free, what's the limit of freedom that I give my son? I would say, he has a lot of freedom, but it's like what Donahue was saying. He's two and a half. He only sees, you know, about, about that high. And he only sees the world that's right here. But, for example, when he showed me when he was two years, two months, that he thought he was capable of making his own scrambled eggs and sausage in the morning, um, I thought, okay, well, you think you're capable. Let's find out. And it turned out that he was capable. He is actually capable of cooking without burning himself on the stove. And today he makes eggs and sausage and potatoes. And um, I have the videos of it on YouTube if you want to see. But um, so it's not, I'm not sitting there thinking, and I remember when he was one and he wanted to show me he was capable of knowing whether it was safe to walk across the street. And he showed me repeatedly that he knew when a car was coming, when a car wasn't. And that when a car was coming, he wanted to be held. He didn't even, to, to this day, in a parking lot, if there's a car, he's like, ma! <laughs> but when there's no car, he's like, I am capable. <laughs> and it doesn't mean I'm not watching <laughs> and paranoid, but it, um, 
it does mean that they take their freedom. They know. They expand it. It's not me sitting around planning. And Hi, my name is Isabel. Uh, this is a question addressed to Rosalind. I wasn't in your conference, so I don't know much about what your thoughts. But um, I would like it if you could explain to me why do you think, or since when do you think, or you had this insight that children age zero to three make conscious choices? Uh, because, well, I think that adults uh, have really an influence on, the, the, on their choices that, the, in that age. And if you could explain more how objectivism clashes with, with this notion to treat ch each children as an individual. Because um, you mentioned earlier how, how objectivism contradicts uh, the theory with treating a, a children as a ra rational individual. So if you could uh, elaborate more on that, please. Um, so first, the contradiction, uh, it's, it's that objectivists idealize human relationships of freedom and respect, mutual freedom and respect. Um, and then they get to their children and they say, just kidding, I know what's best for you and I'm going to make you do what I know is best for you, which is exactly the kind of government that we fight, exactly the kind of relationship with adults that we fight. Um, I, I find that to be very contradictory. Um, but at the same time, it's not, that's not, that's an ex almost an exaggeration of what they're saying. It's like, you know, um, <clears throat> William Thomas did say, I want to have a respectful relationship with my child. I do think coercing him is okay, but I do want to have a respectful relationship with him. So that's, that's where we, we differ. I don't think coercing him <coughs> is okay. Um, I think that you have a respectful relationship with someone, period. And um, it doesn't matter what age they're at. You respect them. End of story. If you're an objectivist, um, or I would argue that's more more consistent with objectivist ethics than um, I will not control you unless you're under a certain age, and then I will. Um, and then to answer your what was your first question? If you could explain uh, how you came to that insight that children make conscious uh, choices when they're age oh, zero to three. That was a kind of a. Um, that, that was a, a strange question. My, my argument, maybe one day I will write an argument about, or a, or a paper about children's brain development. But that is not what this is based on. That's actually the beginning of, beginning of my talk where I say, most objectivists, when I say, I think we should treat children more respectfully, they say, no, 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 you can get to control kids all you want because they're not rational and you get to control irrational people. That's the argument that they make. And the argument that I make in response to that is um, to is to claim that children are not rational and therefore I can use behaviorism on them is just a it doesn't follow because behaviorism wasn't created for irrational human beings. It wasn't created for any kind of human being, as we understand the term. Um, and then I say, um, to claim that children are irrational, and therefore I can use behavior as mom, let's say children are irrational, and you can, you can, you, and therefore you can. Um, I, I'm not arguing either way on that point right now. What I'm arguing is that, let's say children are irrational, it still doesn't follow that using behaviorism on them is the best way to raise them. Um, rather than being attributed to various objectives, I think to you, this contradiction uh, of saying, you know, I want to deal with human beings with respect, uh, which means not coercing them. I want to have a relationship with my child that involves mutual respect. It's okay to coerce my child. Uh, are those positions contradictory? Uh, and, if, and are they what you want? Well, no, they're not contradictory as stated, um, but I, I, I do take some, well, I'm concerned, and I've long been concerned that Rosalind at least uh, misattributes a certain theory, and, and Rosalind tends to contrast two totalizing philosophies, one of which is 
uh, manipulate your children in everything. And the other is, uh, there's never an occasion where you have to coerce your children. So that's that's the the, the contrast that she's drawing. You're arguing for moral greatness. I'm not arguing for moral greatness. I'm arguing for contextuality. So there's some aspects of the parent-child relationship that are different than your relationship with adults. But let me just remark that objectivism holds that you should respond behavioristically to adults in many cases as well. That's the doctrine of sanction in objectivism and the principle of justice, which is to respond to the good with praise and positive incentive and encouragement and respond to the bad and the evil with uh, breaking off relations, disincentive, and moral blame where appropriate. So that's a, an objectivist theory of how to do that. So in that sense, we do those things. Also, there are bad adults, and bad adults do uh, bad things. I could go on. Uh, you drew an example to a diplomat treating a child as a diplomat. There are bad diplomats. There are good diplomats who listen to the, their counselors, but there are bad diplomats who get all the parking tickets in New York and you know, those kind of people. So the, the point here about um, uh, the, what I do want to say that's special about the parent-child relationship is this. Number one, it's not chosen qua relationship between two people. The child doesn't choose their parents. And they have a small child, and they're just on the age of emancipation, but for quite some years, they don't choose their parents. And the parents actually don't choose the child qua person. They don't choose who they're going to get when they have that child. And so, plus, they are all living together, and they're stuck living together. So they are in a situation where the social is heavily primal, in, in primary, in a way that in uh, adult relationships it's not and shouldn't be. And they're in a situation where they are supposed to be in a tight, intimate relationship of mutual respect, but on the one hand, the particularly young child is not in a position to know their parent as a person, and the parent is not in a position to know the child because the child's still developing. So there's aspects of the whole relationship that are just not like the relationship with your adult friends or your lovers or you know, your colleagues and those things. It's not like it in those respects. And so that means, um, given that the children are developing mentally, there are things you do as a parent to, what you want is to encourage your child's development and to, to the extent you can, um, help your child become the kind of person you would like them to be to the extent that you can do that. And how, what are the kinds of things you can do? You can affect the environment they grow up in. Where do you choose to live? What sorts of friends are, are generally around you? Not by cutting them off from people, but just manipulating it. But what, what videos are around the house when they're little kids? It's just, you know, that kind of thing. That, you know, that you talk about them with, about the kid, with your, about your love of books. Or, you know, yes, okay. So, but these kind of things, you do, but there are some times, and it varies with the, with the child, there's some times when they behave in ways that are either uh, dangerous and self-destructive, or ways that are grossly disrespectful of the other people in the social environment, and they're not in a position to, that you, that you can't resolve the issue rationally. And sometimes, though in those situations, coercion is appropriate. So. That's it. And also, uh, you're, uh, when the child is very, very small, there's just you're doing all kinds of things for them. According to objectivism, each of us must use his or her own mind, evaluate, you know, examine the facts, try to examine the arguments according independently. According to objectivism, if there is a contradiction, at least one premise must be false. This conversation could go on probably indefinitely, except that we have other events. And so at this point, what I'm going to say, and, 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 I'm, I'm sorry, at this point what I'm going to say is that now our presentation has come to an end, and it is up to each of you 
to examine what has been said and say what is consistent with reality and what is consistent with the fundamental principles of objectives. Thank you.